way things are, from a couple of years on, things are real horrible here in New York, all over. You're dealing with a lot of uh, people that are maniacs today. You're dealing with an individual who's very basic, who only knows two things, rip off or be ripped off. Many of those who make good by being bad are nowhere to be seen these days. I'd be afraid. Of course I'd be afraid. He's a sick guy. He'd kill any time. You ever wish there isn't anything on earth that I will hide from or back up from. People seem not to understand the close relationship between organized crime and street crime. And certainly in dealing with street crime in his area or any other kind of crime, uh, the uniform of patrol... Presenzano shot four times, his throat cut. Presenzano was allegedly connected. Hello everybody, this is your friend Brett over at NYC Crime Spot. Thank you so much for joining me for this upload. It's going to be a long one, but it's going to be chock full of some amazing information here. Today, we're going to be speaking about an interesting character in New York City organized crime history. Now, this guy isn't a major player in the grand scheme of things, but he holds a very significant part in an event that transpired on December 11th, 1978, the Lufthansa heist. To many, Stephen Stax Edwards is Samuel Jackson in Goodfellas. However, he's more than that. He's a man I've discussed before in uploads such as this, and he's a man who led a short but a very interesting life. In this upload, we will speak to Steve, a brilliant researcher who has dedicated much of his time to getting to the bottom of the story of the Lufthansa heist and the characters involved. We will discuss Stack's criminal career using FBI files and other information, and we will get to possibly the reason you clicked this video, Muhammad Ali. Steve can be reached at novicehistorian at outlook.com. In the second part of this upload, we speak to Rick DeMeo. These days, Rick is a meteorologist, but in his early life, he was a kid from Ozone Park, who grew up on the same block that Stax lost his life in 1978, and had many interactions with Stax growing up. He will share that with us and further confirm Stax's presence in the Ali footage that I will be showing throughout this upload. I hope you enjoy this. It has been a very long time coming, and I'm very pleased to be bringing you some of this information. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of NYC Crime Spot. And we got a special one for you today. We got a little bit of a juicy one for you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about this gentleman right here, Stephen Stax Edwards. Now, of course, I've spoken about Stax on my channel in the past on uploads like this, where I visited the location where he left the van over on East 95th Street in Brooklyn. And, of course, I went to his apartment where he lost his life in December of 78. If you listen to the little tidbit that I played before this, uh, you kind of know what we're going to be talking about here today. We're going to be talking about Stacks, a little bit about what we know about his life, a little bit about his record. Uh, these are some FBI files that we'll be looking at. And, of course, the reason why you clicked on this video, the Muhammad Ali angle of Stack's life, a very interesting angle and something that uh, I personally have never really seen anybody speak about publicly. So to many of you, we might be breaking some news. Um, joining me today first is a gentleman by the name of Steve. He is a researcher who reached out to me a while ago and we started talking about uh, the characters revolving around the Lufthansa heist, whether it be the Jimmy Burke crew, the Vario crew. And he had a lot of knowledge, and he does have a lot of knowledge, and he is an excellent researcher, and he has a lot of interest in getting to the bottom of the characters that make up these crews. And when you think about it, do we really know that much about these characters? When you really start looking at it, not really. So it takes researchers like Steve, like me, to kind of get to the bottom of these things and give you guys a clear picture of who these characters were. And I'm glad that Steve is here today. He has supplied us with some great FBI files. And he has some great knowledge. So I'm going to add Steve to the uh, chat now. And um, let's welcome him in. Steve, how are you, buddy? Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. How about you? Pretty good, brother. So introduce yourself to, to my audience, you know, a little bit about um, what you're interested in and some of your research. Yeah, so... I've been researching the Lufthansa heist, Robert Slown's crew, and basically all the Goodfellas stuff for quite some time. 
uh, years at this point. Uh, ever since I watched Goodfellas when uh, 20 years ago for the first time, I was always enamored by the movie and just the people involved in it. So at one point after watching it a few times, I noticed it was based off true events. So I started doing some, you know, Googling some stuff. Back then, the internet wasn't as advanced as it was today. So you didn't really have too many details. But eventually, as we are now, I got more and more interested in this stuff and started researching the crew and everybody involved when it came to just Goodfellas itself. And I basically started putting in FBI requests. And basically, that's where we are today. Yeah, that's awesome. And that's what it takes with a lot of this stuff. And some people that don't, do research or don't have YouTube channels or anything, you know, a lot of this stuff is very difficult to come by. I mean, we spoke on the phone. I've had FBI requests out for a year. I still haven't heard anything. So this is a lot of a waiting game. This is a lot of frustration at times, but you know, I want to give a lot of credit to you, Steve. And I really appreciate you reaching out to me almost a year ago. And here we are now finally doing this upload. Yeah, I thank you for having me on. It, it's a long process to get some of these files. Uh, it takes a long time. The FBI will sometimes they'll they'll dangle you around, so to speak. And when you do get files, if they do get back to you, they'll be all basically blocked out. Every there won't be a disclosure at all. It, it's it's difficult at times. Sometimes they'll, you'll get stuff that it's better than others. Sometimes there'll just be entire sections is completely blocked out of information it's, and that's the juicy stuff that's the stuff that you me and others want to know about and to really right. get the bottom of and maybe one day we'll get lucky and it'll be full disclosure uh, for the most part but you know it is what it is you got to roll with the punches and you got to really think outside the box in order to, to get your research and to get the, to get the information you, there's different ways mm. to do it but you get pretty decent at it after a while Right, right. So let's get into Stax. Obviously, in popular culture, to many people, Stax is Samuel Jackson, right? I mean, he's the guy in Goodfellas who makes the mistake of leaving the van on East 95th Street in Brooklyn. And he's kind of just this weird little footnote in organized crime history, right? He's not some major player, but he is a, certainly an interesting player. And he, he led an interesting life, a short life, but a, a very interesting life. So, Steve, who is Stax to you? when we're talking about the Goodfellas crew and all these characters revolving around Jimmy Burke, Barrio, and, and that whole scene? Well, to me, he, like you said, he is a footnote, right? Even in the movie, he isn't in there that long. He's sort of just Henry Hill, Larry Leola just slips him in at one point, just saying, hey, even Stax Edwards got involved or whatever it might be. So even in that point, he was sort of just slipped in. To me, he's... He's an interesting person because he did so much in the short life that he had, right? He was a, a blues player. He played music. He had a band, right? He was a bodyguard for Muhammad Ali. So, and of course, at, at other points, he was a, a criminal, right? He did things that uh, he would, he, he got arrested quite a few times. And eventually he loses his life for a mistake he did, made after the Lufthansa heist. Right, right. And I suppose it could be argued that regardless of that mistake, I mean, I guess we could assume that Stax probably wasn't long for this world anyway. I mean, I think there's probably a good argument to be made for that. Um, but he made it a lot easier, you know, by by doing what he did with the van. Um, so, Steve, do you want to do you want to I want to pull up some. Do you want to start looking at these these FBI files that you sent me? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think we'll get a kind of an idea of maybe, you know, of Stax. And let me see this one here. We're going to go through a bunch of these, but I want to get to kind of the ones where we can kind of get. All right. So let's let's look at this guy. So we got a background here. So this is from the FBI. Steve, thank you. He's the one that obtained these. We see Stack's date of birth, January 14th, 1947. He's born in Manhattan. And a lot of what's in here also what Steve sent is um, Stack's record. So if we look at. If we look at this here, um, well, his education level, 10th grade education, uh, John Adams High School in Queens, diabetes, obesity, cardiac difficulties, associates, Paul Vario, Tommy DeSimone, Jimmy Burke. There you go. You got Tommy DeSimone's address right there for anyone interested. So let's look at some of his record. Um, so what do we have here, Steve? July 4th, 66, Vagabondage. 
So what is that? Is that like when you don't have ID and they can't, they don't know who you are? I would think that he was maybe living on the streets in Madrid, perhaps in Spain. I, I that one made me laugh when I first saw it because yeah. how did he even get there? That's it's, the thing that I'm, I have questions yeah. about. Yeah, I think that's was an like, old charge. Like even in even was. in the states, like if they if they catch you on the street and you don't have ID, they don't know who the hell you are. I think that's a charge they used to hit you with, and they they might still hit you with that. I'm not particularly sure but that's very interesting as you said madrid spain yeah what is the way there i have no <laughs> idea yeah there's some things ladies and gentlemen that i'm not sure myself so it's it's just you know something else another piece of the puzzle that we have to try to find out and maybe get right. to the bottom of right then we can fast forward to what do we got um we got 69 january possession of stolen property which i guess was di dismissed we got, uh, I guess, January 26, 73, attempted bribery, prosecuted September of 74, three years. So did he go away at that time? Did, did he go away for three years and then maybe get released early and then got probation? Is that what we're looking at here, Steve? It might be that. Yeah, it might be that he was arrested for some time and then he got let back out in the streets and maybe 77, 78. That might be it. Maybe he got let out earlier than that based off good behavior. It's difficult yeah. to say. Yeah. Yeah, because it has that July 29th unless, date after that. Yeah, yeah, unless they, he got probation. Some of these are sort of hard to to yeah. navigate through at times. Of course, of course. Yeah, and if you've ever had possession of the FBI files, anyone listening, you, you exactly what Steve said. Some of this stuff, you know, it's hard to navigate through. So then we got on the bottom, arrested. And, yeah, go ahead, right, Steve. And then, uh, and then just above that, though, like there's some things like we have the father, the mother, the brother, sister, that's all blocked out. I can tell you who they were just based off of, you know, looking in other areas. I can tell you who his father was. I can tell you who his mother was, that sort of thing. Uh, so some of the stuff you could, in other words, I mean, not not really pertinent, but it has that you can sort of find information in other ways and you can put that, you know, input that in in certain parts. Like, for example, and the some of these FBI files, the van license plate, right, will be blocked right. out. But if you look at the photos, you can get the license plate and kind of just, I don't know, write it in there or just make a mental right. note that, hey, we have that. So it's like you have to look into other areas. And again, it gets it's, it's, it's interesting because you're sort of like a detective in some ways where you're trying to just piece it all together. It's part of the fun, I guess you can say. Of course, man. Yeah, you become a detective and you be, essentially you become a journalist in your own right. You know, a lot of people uh, think of journalists like you have to work for NBC or you have to have this high profile job. You're a journalist. There's journalists everywhere. You know, if you, you interview people, you do stuff that Steve does that I do. I mean, I'm not trying to call myself a journalist, but it it is essentially journalism. You know, I mean, when you get these FBI files and you piece a story together, Steve has told me he also is into the genealogy also and getting to the bottom of these things. So it takes a lot to do. Um, and I guess this was that bribery arrested 130th Street in Linden Boulevard while in possession of a stolen national rental car, stolen merchandise from Klein's department store. Defendant offered the police officer an $800 bribe. Yeah. I mean, I know it's the 70s, but I don't know if that's enough to 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 uh, want to lose your job over. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Back then, I know the New York Police Department was a little bit more corrupt, I guess you can say, than they yeah. are now. So I've heard stories about that. Obviously, they didn't they didn't take the bribe, so he he made a mistake. But <laughs> funny that he tried anyway. It's not the first of these guys, by the way, that try to do this. I have some things on Krugman that he tried to do the same thing. So Martin it was Krugman, a little bit really? later. Wow. Yeah, but we could you know talk about that a different time if you wish. Sure, love to. So what else we got here? We got May thirteenth, seventy three assault. New York City, June 25th, 73, dismissed, burglary, fight with Paramore. Um, Don't know much about that one. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I look, every one of these dates, I look in the newspapers, see if there's anything. Some of it just doesn't make the notes. It is what it is. It's just something that may be insignificant compared to what else is going on at the time. Right, right. October 10th, 1973, assault, Brooklyn, New York, January 21st, 74, dismissed, obstruction of justice. Did attempt on October 10th, 73, at Crescent and Linden while attending a funeral to prevent arrest of Thomas D. Simone. Uh, and then you see Tommy D. Simone's address again by punching New York Police Department officer in the groin. So this is going to go back to the funeral of one Leonard Vario, who in 1973, now this, this history is still a little fuzzy to me, Steve. Maybe you can help me out. So... Leonard Vario gets basically 
whoever he was with that night, they throw him at Wyckoff Hospital. They just throw him at the curb or whatever they do. He's got burns to 90% of his body. Yep. There is some big fire going on in the area, which I believe they considered an arson. So maybe Vario had yeah. something to do with that fire and shit just went haywire. And right. essentially he ends up losing his life. Is that that's kind of what happened there, Steve? Basically, it was an arson, robbery, something like that. He they he ends up getting burned, as you said, 90% of his body, and he dies a few years later. Yeah, that's what I've read about it. Right. And at this funeral, for those of you who don't know, as it mentions here, there is, and you know what? Let's bring up the article, actually. I think I think that would be pretty interesting. So let me just take this away for a second, because we have an article about that here, about the uh, Vario funeral. Let's see now. Okay. TV men beaten at mob right. So two television cameramen were beaten and their expensive equipment was damaged yesterday while they were filming the funeral in Brooklyn of mafia bigwig Paul Vario's son. Um, so it talks about the cameraman. Police said more Chang, who's the cameraman, 6,000 camera was smashed during the assault and that other equipment was damaged. The two victims declined to press charges. Detective Kenny McCabe, who I've spoken about on this channel a lot, of the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, went to the aid of the cameraman and was punched in the head by another mourner. The latter identified as Stephen Edwards. So Stax punches Kenny McCabe in the head. One guy you don't want to punch in the head if you know anything about him. Um, so that that is in reference to that arrest that we showed right there. Um, let's see now. Let me make the screen back bigger again. And then we got another one on the bottom there. Again, arrested by postal inspectors on credit card charge. Now, Steve, this is something that Stax was big in, right? He was big into the credit card thievery and all that stuff, right? Credit card fraud. Yeah, I heard at certain times he had 20 different credit cards on that he has stolen off people. Um, so despite some of his legitimate employment as playing at Henry Hill's club, right? Another thing that he did was, was he, you know, did stuff like this and not just this too. I've heard that he's stolen property. He used to steal a lot of different stuff and just sell it on the streets. I heard stuff like that as well. So he was big into this type of stuff, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Big business back then, especially with the, the, the orbit, like with these guys, I mean, hijacking, Fencing stolen goods. I mean, even if you just watch Goodfellas, you kind of get an idea. That's so that's, that's their that's, speciality. Yeah, that's where they're right. that's where they're making their money is this stuff. And it's not like how it is today where the airport is. It's highly more. Uh, it, it's it was looser back then. So back then you can steal a truck. It's right. different now. It's I don't even think that they, they don't do it anymore. Not to my knowledge, anyways. No, it's pretty it's pretty tough it's to hijack risky. now. Yeah, it's risky. Yeah. yeah, it's too risky. I mean, um, you know, as soon as you get into one of those uh 18 wheelers or whatever it is, I'm sure there's a camera looking at you as soon as you get in there. So, you know, this just is not even there too, just on the just on the highway itself. Of just course. people yeah. have cameras, cell phones, and all that stuff. So it's it's too risky for a, a crew like the Robert Clowns crew or the mob in general just to just to just to do it. Of course, of course. Now you sent me another batch here. Let's let's look at this. See if we can find anything interesting here, Steve. I know you you've looked at this a lot. So let's see what we got here. Um. So this is just. Well, I got to go back to slide one. Detective 106 Priest and Squad 101st Street Liberty Queens, New York, stated that Stephen Daniel Edwards, also known as Pernell Edwards, stacks stacks, was killed on December 18th, 1978. Uh, by being shot through the head. The shooting occurred at 10916 120th Street. Once again, if you guys want to see where that happened, uh, I, I'll put the link to the video in the description of this video. Um, the victim was living with Blank, who I assume is his girlfriend, Steve. Um, I believe so, yeah. yeah. At the residence, and they found cards. Okay, so this talks about his death. And now, what is this? Have you Have you made any sense of this? I know it's a lot of blanked out stuff. My guess is is that maybe the car he, he had or his girlfriend had it looks like a Medicaid car that he, maybe that was found on him or was his girlfriend, something like that. Okay. I'm thinking it's just maybe stuff found in his possession, perhaps. Um, okay, okay, cool. It's hard to say, yeah. So let's see slide three. Uh, so this talks about him again, right? Six feet, 280 pounds, was acquainted with the deceased blank. Um, I don't know who I don't know who they might be referring to there. Um, it's hard to say. Yeah, it's, it's hard, hard to say. say. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. On the day of the homicide, the victim came in sweating and upset at his home. Now, is that the day of Stack's homicide? Is that what they're referring to right there? 
It could be. Yeah. The, the one be. thing I, I do want to bring up, though, I mean, this is sort of off topic here. I often see his name referred to as Parnell. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Parnell Edwards. Yes. don't know if that's a nickname, but his name was Stephen Daniel Edwards. Um, that's right. But for some reason, they, whatever it might be, they, I always constantly see Parnell as being one of his, I don't know, his, his name. I know his father's name was uh, Parnell or something like that. So maybe that's the confusion there. But okay. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people don't know that. And I remember when I put out that video a while ago, somebody questioned like Steven. They didn't even know the Steven angle. A lot of people, they just call him Parnell Stacks or Stacks Edwards or whatever. But yeah, Steven Daniel Edwards, for those who, who want to know, uh, that is his name. And then we have um, FBI number. He's a male Negro. Of course, that's the language they used back then. Date of birth, January 1547. And then it mentions once again what we spoke about, about being arrested at the funeral of leonard vario and what do we have here so we have uh associates these right? yeah these known associates of him obviously we have jimmy burke there right we have henry hill the other is blocked out who knows i know he was good friends with tommy de simone uh they i think i think when stacks got gets killed ironically by Tommy. I think he calls his mother up or goes sees his mother and said, I'm so sorry what happened to Stax, knowing that he was the one who pulled the trigger on him. And right. I think it was Seth he was with him at the time. Right, right. From what we know from history, I mean, listen, you believe what you want to believe, but what is assumed is that Thomas Simone and Angelo Seppe did in fact execute Stacks within his residence at Ozone Park. Um, I think that's, right. I think that's kind of widely accepted at this point, Steve. Right? I mean, for the most yeah, part. And with Stacks being killed, he's going to be the first to die in the Latanza heist. This is a week after the robbery. Everybody. Correct. So, it, the robbery happens December the eleventh to seventy eight in the morning. Right. Uh, these guys are getting geared up and ready. In a week later, about maybe it could be a couple of days. Maybe it's even like eight nine days later after that. The eighteenth killed. Yeah. Is it the 18th? So exactly a week so. later. And it's because of the whole van fiasco. Of course. Yeah, I believe it's the 18th. And uh, once again, guys, we got all the articles. We got a lot of fun stuff. So let's show the article of Stack's uh, reported death. Now, this article comes out on the 20th of Wednesday, and they're talking about uh, Monday. So it would it would mm -hmm. be the what's considered the 16th, I suppose. So seek gun death clue. Queens police yesterday were seeking possible eyewitness and information concerning the shooting death of Stephen Edwards, 31 of 109 16120th Street in South Ozone Park, not too far from uh, Robert's Lounge for those who, who know. Uh, Detective uh, John Hammond of the Ozone Park Station said police were alerted to the shooting by an anonymous phone call. That's interesting, too. I'll ask you what you think about that. About 7 p.m. on Monday, the caller said a man had been shot on the second floor of the house on a quiet residential street. Hammond and Edwards was Hammond said Edwards was found lying on the floor with several bullet wounds in the head and body. He had been living in the apartment with a girlfriend who was not at home at the time. I always find it funny, like like a guy like Stax, right? Like so, let's say Thomas D. Simone and Seppe killed him, right? You would think mm -hmm. that they would just shoot him in the head, boom, it's over with. I mean, it just seems like, according to the detective, they loaded this guy full of bullets. Kind of foul. It's like the movie. Thinking. Yeah. Sort of like the movie, if you think about it. He's, right. you know, you always like, or even like for your own funeral, shoots him in the head. And if you see another, you know, basically another scene of that, you keep shooting at him. So I don't know if uh, they got that from this article here. But yeah, he he gets killed a week or t a week, week and a half, whatever it might be later after the robbery. And it's funny how a day or two later his body gets discovered, it seems like. Basically, that's what it sounds like in the article. The girlfriend's not home. It, right. Interesting stuff. Yeah, and that anonymous call, that's interesting too, huh? Somebody in the same house, maybe in the area, who knows about it. I, I don't know. Uh, it could be yeah. somebody in the house. like somebody, Because then he, wasn't he having an apartment upstairs. in the back of the house, something like that? Yeah. Yeah, so he was up, I believe, upstairs apartment. I guess somebody probably lived downstairs. Um. But, you know, back then, as we talked about, we're talking about a different world. You make a call on some payphone and God knows where, you know, could it even been somebody in that crew maybe had a guilty conscience? All right, let's let the, you know, we don't want to let stacks rot away. You know, let's, I don't know. You never know the psychology behind this stuff. And the thing is, too, is that these guys are 
a week later, a couple days later after the robbery, the FBI knows that who did this robbery. They narrowed it down to two crews, right? The Robert Slown's crew and John Gotti's crew. And according to things that I've seen and read about and, and you know, videos that I've watched, right? Edward McDonald's, the DA or FBI agent at the time, they said, and after that, they fa- figured out it was the Robert Slown's crews with Jimmy Burke who, who, who did this heist. But to prove it was a different thing. And you could, but these guys are bragging about it too, to people right. in bars. That, hey, like Angelo Seppi was telling people, hey, listen, you know, we we pulled off this heist. I'm, you know, he buys a he buys a car, all this other stuff. And and you, it wouldn't surprise me if they bragged it out there. Hey, you know, Stax is no longer around. That, right. that sort of thing, right? You <laughs> exactly. say it to somebody, so they overhear it. Oh, you know what? I like Stax. So maybe they gave us send a phone call to the cops and maybe it's something like that happened you just you don't know for sure um right 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 and, and outside of like yeah. um i'll go ahead i'm sorry Steve. no go ahead no absolutely go ahead yeah and outside of like lewis werner you know um former uh lewis werner he worked for the lufthansa at some point right uh yeah he was an employee there with uh right. peter grunwald and grunwald correct outside of those guys who essentially are criminals, but sticking with like the Jimmy Burke crew, for example, I believe Seppe is the first one, I believe in April or something of 79. He's, he's the first one they actually bring in. Right. As far as those guys are concerned. I think it's February. February? I think it was was Seppe and Warner. They were together arrested in court. And again, there's probably footage of of there of them somewhere or a photo. Something's probably taken, right? Mugshots, who knows? But, uh, the only one that got convicted of all this was Warner, right? He was yep. the only one. And then uh, Grunwald basically says, uh, while the police are there, from what I understand, uh, Lou, they know everything, basically, is what Grunwald says. Grunwald slips, and I don't want to get too far off beat here, but I think he sure. slips away. Greg goes into witness protection or somewhere, and he's never found again. Like, they don't know where he, he just disappears into the program basically witness protection if memory serves me right yeah yeah so seppi gets brought in i also read that you know obviously jimmy burke gets brought in soon i think they get him on the whole consorting with felons he's like on probation or whatever so like oh that's a good way we'll get jimmy in because we we see him hanging out with seppi or whoever it is right and i also read that frank burke was also brought in for questioning at that time uh i don't know if you've ever came across that but I also I, read that somewhere. You as well. you might be right. Yeah, it, you. That sounds right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So obviously, yeah. these guys are one by one being brought in, getting, but mostly they're, being killed. Yeah, they're getting warned too. So the FBI are going to people like Robert McMahon and people like you know Henry and people like um, Joe Manry and saying, "Listen, you know we have like you're you're next. You're going to get killed next. We know the robbery coming with us, and these guys are refusing it, right? Which is admirable, really, because in some ways, because you have seven to nine people that committed this heist, right? There's the number is you know can be argued, but they're being warned. Listen, you're going to be the next one killed, and they refuse. And a couple of weeks, months, a month goes by, they get they get killed." Yeah, yeah, they get killed together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manry and um, McMahon. Yeah, uh, no, then, I think. Yeah, May I think seventy nine. Yeah, and before that, uh, Tommy goes missing, right? Yeah, that's in January, and I think Marty goes missing in January Marty. as well, right? So Marty it, goes missing. Then you have uh, Kafora. Um, yeah, that's one's hard else? to know. Yeah, yeah Louis Kafora and his wife right. Joanna McCartney. Yeah. Get, uh, killed i the exact date of that still trying to figure that out it's i hear i see mixed things online um, yeah. but they get killed uh paulo lacastri gets killed right as well who supposedly also participated in the whole heist really the last couple people who survived this whole thing was henry uh jimmy jimmy burke his son right frankie burke he's not gonna kill his own son and right. I mean, he shouldn't. I mean, there, you know, there are stories about that happening too, though, in some cases with the mob. And then the other one was Angelo Seppi, who basically outlived everyone, right, to eighty-four, and yep. you know, that's, he made a tragic end with his girlfriend. Correct. Yeah, he gets murdered over in uh, the Bath Beach section of Brooklyn. He's living in the apartment. I guess he's like a super in the apartments at that time. He's got like some kind of basement apartment, and he gets killed yeah. with his nineteen-year-old girlfriend Joanne Lombardo. What yeah, he's doing at that time is. I don't know, robbing drug dealers or something. 
probably a, a little fall from grace from him from where he was at a few years prior. I'm sure he spent any Latanza money that he received from the heist. I think Jimmy personally liked him. I that was always my argument that right. Jimmy liked Tommy. He liked Angelo Seppe. Um, Henry was sort of just like you know what he was. He, I'm sure he liked Henry, but not as much as those other two. Right. I got the same sense when I did that Sepe video trying to do research. I got the sense that, that Jimmy, you know, had a soft spot for Sepe. Um, and we kind of talked about all the players that we know. But then there's the other there's this angle with the uh, Anthony, the snake Rodriguez, who was, I guess, is reported to be a brother in law of Sepe's. We don't know if he really took part in it. I did a real short video on my channel about him. He's mentioned in a couple of books and, you know, when, when Vinny Asaro goes on trial in like 2015 or so for the Latanza, the news actually mentions the snake again. I guess he was brought up in court, uh, Anthony Rodriguez. So we don't know if he really took part, but he lost his life in the late eighties um, at the hands of his own snake collection. So, yeah, which is again, these guys are, I always like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Island of Misfit Toys. A lot of these guys are misfits in their own way. Some right. are pretty educated, right? Uh, Robert McMahon, right? Pretty educated guy. Joe Mandry to the extent to Richie Eaton, who didn't wasn't involved with the heist, but relatively educated guy, came from a good background. Then you have the other side of that equation, right? You have people like Angelo Sape, who is... Again, he's not very educated. Uh, Tommy De Simone, Stax, they they on the other side. They're pre pretty good with probably the criminal aspect, right? right. And they know crimes and how to commit them. Although they were arrested, some of them quite a bit. Jimmy too, but it, they're a lot of misfits in their own way. That some of them are just come from various backgrounds, and they're meeting that Robert's Lounge or the Suite or wherever and planning this thing. Yeah, yeah, like what you said, basically misfits. I mean, this is kind of like. This is kind of like how I handle my channel, Steve. Like, you know, there's channels they talk about like the glorious days of the mob and Lucky Luciano. Mm -hmm. I'm more into like the gritty 60s, 70s, 80s, that whole like all the misfits. You know, I, I love discussing that real gritty New York City stuff. Not that that other stuff isn't cool, but it's a little more glamorized. And yeah. I get a sense that you're kind of the same way. I kind of love mm -hmm. the, the real gritty stuff. Maybe the lesser known characters and the guys that make up some of these uh these 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 groups like um whether it be the right. DeMeo crew or Jimmy Burke crew or the Vario crew there's a lot of interesting characters out there right and with you know you have somebody like Carlo Gambino right he's calling the shots right yeah he's a he's an interesting person but what about the people a couple rungs down the ladder right a couple pe people you don't know about so much people like a uh, Henry Hill or, or somebody like a Stax Edwards who they're an right. associate of an associate of a crime family somebody who's just who only known fame here is that he's an Ali associate a bodyguard and he's known for this heist and aside from that he dies at the age of around 31 I think it is and that's not much is known like you said a footnote in history right right so let's get to the Ali stuff because this is the real juicy stuff. This is why a lot of people like it. Don't I hope you guys aren't skipping through this conversation just to see this, but <laughs> we'll see about that. So so let's get to this article, Steve. This article is from March of 71. Of course, Ali, he's gearing up for what would become uh dubbed the fight of the century. It's Ali Frazier one, right? So this is huge, right? Um this is an article. I'll show you guys the full article here. And, and then I cropped out the interesting parts that we're going to read right now. So all night jab is jabber finished. So look up here. Stax Edwards is Muhammad Ali's man. He's one of Muhammad Ali's mean, mean men. He is the big, mean looking black man. You always see with Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali was trying to fight his way out of a crowd. Stax Edwards has shoulders like a truck. And when the crowds moved in on Muhammad Ali, Stax Edwards always moved the crowds. And this is quoting Stax. I'm a professional crowd clearer, Stax Edwards, who has a weight of 270 pounds, always said. Stax is a mean mother. Stax Edwards had to clear away a crowd outside the flowers on Fifth Avenue Hospital off Central Park West at 106th Street around 1 o'clock this morning. It wasn't much of a crowd, just four people, but Stax Edwards did his usual fine job. Clear the entrance. Clear the entrance, Stax Edwards shouted. Nobody moved. Nobody had to move because there was only four people waiting outside the hospital. Um, so we go up here, uh, doo, doo, doo. there was a skinny kid from the New York paper. A skinny kid did not budge and Stax Edwards gave the kid a push. The skinny kid screamed. Stax Edwards did not have to do this, but Stax Edwards did not realize that there were only four people in the crowd outside the hospital. 
Uh, it had not yet occurred to Stax Edwards that his man, Muhammad Ali, was no longer the champion of the universe and the stars and planets. So it's kind of like a thug attitude. I mean, you come outside, there's like four people out there, and he's out there, oh, get out of the way, pushing people out of the way. Kind of gets into his mentality a little bit. Yeah, it, it's funny in a way. He <clears throat> he was so used to, I think, pushing people out before Ali lost, and then now the, it's just a new champion, basically. Exactly. I think the article even exactly. says that, and it's Joe Frazier. And, you know, Ali is, at this point, irrelevant as of right now, at least according, at least during that point, because you know, he lost. But, right. yeah, and this is what always piqued my interest about him. I'm thinking, well, because I've read in the past, okay, so Stax Edwards, right? I've heard this thing that he was Muhammad Ali's bodyguard. So after getting a subscription to newspapers, plug his name in, and lo and behold, there's the article with him. One of a couple. There's more than just that. Yeah, one I got there. another one. Let's so, look at another one, and then we'll. T so this is another one, uh, for also from March, uh, and it has some other uh, interesting stuff here. So there's the article. We'll zoom in here. Stax Everett sat his 285 pounds overflowing the chair on the 25th floor of the New Yorker Hotel. Nobody got by him into the room he was guarding. Muhammad Ali, who is to fight Joe Frazier tonight at Madison Square Garden for the heavyweight championship of the world, was relaxing inside. I don't really like reporters, Stax, said Stax. It might be different if Burt Lancaster wanted in. Lancaster, mm -hmm. the actor, will act as a color man during the closed-circuit broadcast of the schedule. 15-round fight. Duh, duh, duh. I'll be guarding him till Tuesday, said Stax. I don't need no sleep. This is the most important fight of Ali's career, which he began with Cassius Clay. And let's see if there's anything else about Stax. So there's nothing else here. So, so they're building this reputation. We're going to show you guys some video, too. They're building this reputation of this mean man, this mean, tough guy who's there to protect Ali, even though Ali towers over him. But he's like this little, you know, around six foot, 285 kind of bulldog of a man um yeah yeah he definitely a, a guy not to mess with right big guy right one of those yeah. guys that you would see like a bouncer at a club that just you know he he's big and you just don't want to you don't you know what you don't want to fuck with the guy basically exactly exactly so i think right now is time to play some video now it's one thing steve of course you do research you know and we we like love to find things like these it's one thing to see a picture of a person but it's another thing when you hear their voice it's like wow but when you see these people in movement it's like it, it really just brings the character to life much like if you guys see the roy DeMeo barbecue footage you're like oh wow look at this we could see the DeMeo crew talking and walking so it, just to just to con for everybody's context about this whole thing. So when I found those articles, right, um, with stacks, I I think I sent them to you, right? At least the one I did, if I remember yep. right. And you and I were sort of looking through. I had one video that I found. I'm like, this guy looks just like him. Like I, I think I sent it to you. It sat behind him, and then you found some photos of a person that's like you and I put our heads together and said this. It looks we only had one photo compare it to of Stax Edwards, and we're saying, well, you know what? That it looks just like him. Like shit, it, it has to be. It, it has to be him. And like you, I think you said you somebody you have somebody that I don't want to maybe spoil that part that has confirmed this. Yes, yes, somebody by the name of Rick has confirmed it, and Rick is also going to appear in this upload later. Rick grew up in Ozone Park. And after I did the stacks video, he emailed me and he's like, man, you brought me back. I grew up in Ozone Park. I knew stacks as a kid around the neighborhood. So Rick is going to be appearing in this upload, Steve. So that's going to add more credence to the story. Yeah, absolutely. And it's good to know, have people that know these guys from back then. That way they can say definitively, listen, this, that is him. That is absolutely him without a doubt. And it, like right. you said, it gives credence to what we're doing here exactly exactly so guys let's look at some footage i edited this together uh, a couple of press conferences um at that time uh ali frazier won and um it's funny in one part you'll see ali saying i don't need no bodyguards and then it shows the next clip you'll see he's with stacks the bodyguard so let's play this uh let's look at this black movements as they call it even when the stuff was at i'm sorry i gotta rewind this so we'll start from the beginning guys and you're gonna see a gentleman behind ali in the blue navy blue long shirt take a good look at that guy let's play this now i don't know he, uh, he's uh it's not that his fellows just tie out 
I, this is my defense. Yeah, I'm out of range. I haven't built it. So I'll pause it. You see the gentleman back there, and I got some stills that I'll be showing as well. In radar, see? Pop, I'm moving and dancing, and I know when I'm in hitting range. When I'm in hitting range, I might come up. As long as I'm not in hitting range. Right, Burke Lancaster? Don't play. How do you compare? Romania. Guards. Do I have guards? No. No, I have helpers. Fellows driving me around and system trainers and spawn parties. So right here, you're going to see Stacks uh, messing around with Ali. Guards for what? What do I need guards for? They can't guard presidents. If somebody wants you, they're going to get you. I don't, I'd run into no hostility, even during the draft pressure. And when they first heard my religion, black Muslims, as they call it, even when the stuff was at the... So let me remove that, and then we'll show some stills. So there you go. That's a good still. Yeah, and if that's not the mugshot of Stacks, I don't know what is, okay? So there you go right there, Stacks. Let me bring this up over here. We'll remove that. Of course, that's a couple of years later. He's down and out. It looks like he lost weight. He's been in and out of prison a bunch of times. Uh, here's another still. Here's that one there, and here's that one there. There's also well. uh, photos that I think you have too, right? Do you have the photos? I think you sent them to me quite a while back, and if not, I can... You know, maybe you could bring it up. Uh, I don't know. I, I might have. I mean, I took the stills from these videos. I might have had some photos. Um, I'll see if I can get a hold of those. Um, but basically, it, what you're looking at here is you're looking at stacks. Um, and if that guy's not six foot 280, I don't know who is, right? <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could see him. And even as one of the articles uh, mentioned, overflowing in his chair. I mean, you could see this guy. You need a big chair for this gentleman right here. So yeah, he's a big guy. Yeah, so that, when we were able to find that, that would just solidify everything. And I, like I said, Rick is going to appear in this upload too. And when I showed him the tape, he said, that stacks 100%, and we'll get to that later. So, Steve, what's, what's your opinion on that footage? I think it's amazing that after 50 years or whatever, how long it's been, that you, you could finally find more stuff on this guy out there, that he was – he was around Ali. I'm, I'm going through footage, trying to see if we could find a guy that matches his description. Lo and behold, uh, I sent you one. You found a, quite a few others, I think, um, about him. So including photos. So which is, you know, credit to you goes to that. Um, a lot more stuff on him. And, you know, it's just it's amazing to me that this guy who's participating in this heist seven, eight years early was around Ali. It, yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, what a fall from grace. I mean, the only fuzzy thing that, about the story is how he actually got connected with that job. Um, back then, sports did them was the mob involved in all sorts of things. Of course, did did somebody that was connected maybe give Stacks that job? Who knew somebody? Who knew somebody? That's the only fuzzy thing, Steve. We don't know actually how he became in that position. No, no, we don't. It's that's the interesting part about it is how where did he get that job from? Was he known for being a bodyguard, maybe small time? And somebody said, hey, listen, Ali's looking for somebody. I can put in a word. We don't, we don't know for sure. Yeah. And you would think that the feds would mention that, too. So you sent me another article where this is from, I guess, a few years ago, uh, Steve. It was a post article, I believe. Yeah, while I was preparing for today, I was looking to see if there was anything else out there that could give credence to this whole thing to make this argument more, more legitimate that, hey, Stax was indeed Ali's bodyguard. And lo and behold, I did find something else. All right. So let's add this to the stage here. So this is just one piece of the article. Let me just make my screen a little yeah. bigger. New York Post. Yeah, New York Post. There you go. So let's see. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Familiar, come with me. So this is actually about the Ali Frazier thing, right? And then it says, uh, it was O'Brien's yeah. task to memorialize a night that was almost too surreal for words. Ali's chief bodyguard was a name was a man named Stax Edwards. You may know him better as the ill-fated character portrayed by Samuel Jackson in Goodfellas, sent on his bloody way by Joe Pesci's Tommy, because instead of getting rid of the truck like he was supposed to, he got stoned and went to his girlfriend's. Edwards went wherever Ali went that night. Edwards was all over the post, eight full years before the Lufthansa heist. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So, so now we have a big newspaper, right? New York Post, legitimate, confirming that this person was indeed Muhammad Ali's bodyguard. Yeah. And listen, you research a lot. I know you're in some forums on the internet. Um, 
pretty much just on YouTube. And we operate in this world of like naysayers, right? There's this world. Oh, that's not true. That can't be true. Oh, I never heard that. So it's not true. You know, it's, it's tough to navigate, but I think this conversation that we've been having is enough really to put it in people's minds. Um, not only who this character was, but some of the incredibly interesting things that he did in this short life. Yeah, absolutely. A, a guy that really, he did a lot for only being 31. He's known, he was around, what, 22, 23 at the time that he was Ali's bodyguard. So yeah. he did quite a bit in terms of, of, of in terms of that. It's just, you know, again, like I've been saying, interesting stuff just about him and about all these guys too, because he's just one small piece of the puzzle here when it comes to this whole robbery. Of course. Yeah. So, Steve, um, I think we'll end this here because I'm going to be speaking, like I said, to Rick also, and I'm going to be adding a couple of more tidbits to this upload. And I really would love to have you back again. I mean, I know that you had or you still maybe do have a YouTube channel. You're not too active on that. I know that you have you have your own life, your own job. And as you know, this stuff takes up a lot of time, but I know you're still doing research. I mean, mm -hmm. whether it's your channel, whether you want to go back into the content game or you want to come on my channel steve i would love to have you on again i mean just to really just talk lufthansa and talk these real like gritty low-key characters that make up the jimmy burke crew the viral crew and that make up the movie goodfellas in and goodfellas it's almost glamorized right nice clothes nice cars good stuff these guys i mean they did they were i mean it was angelo seppe walking around like Frankie Carbone and Goodfellas with a nice expensive P code and nice. I mean, not a chance. That's not really what these guys are about. Right, Steve? That's not the picture that I get. No, it's not the picture I get either. The The movie paints them that they're extremely successful, right? That it's basically all fine and good till basically when Billy Bats gets killed. And then you could kind of see, and I think they even reference that, uh, Scorsese references in the movie, that that's when the movie kind of takes the more turn that this isn't what it's cracked up to be. But up to that point, they're saying that these guys are going to the Cope, Copacabana, they're walking to the back end <laughs> yeah, yeah. of it, all this other stuff. But right. I mean, to be honest with you, a lot of these guys are getting arrested a lot. They're uh just i think i read right before this interview because you, you forget stuff it's just what it is when it comes to this you remember one thing you forget another but jimmy burke had 40 arrests right 40 <laughs> arrests I, I mean that doesn't pick somebody who is a you know successful right. in this right. whole life right and some of these guys like you know you talk about tony ocardo who really never i don't even think he was in jail once so yeah. But Goodfellas paints this picture that, you know, it was all everything was fine and dandy. It's it's not the, it's not necessarily the case, especially right. with this crew, because that's just with Jimmy Burke being arrested that many times. These other guys, Robert McMahon, they're going through divorces, they're getting arrested. So it's not the life that it's that's cracked up to be, I think, at the end. of the Right. Right. And that's not to say, like, they didn't dress up. I mean, we listen. Yeah. We see pictures of Burke and Simone and Hill. They're wearing suits. Maybe they're at a nice night out at Henry Hill suite or they're at some club or whatever, but that's not everyday life. I mean, everyday life, it's real street shit. I mean, this, these guys are in the street, man. You don't wear, you don't wear, um, suits uh, when you're stopping by uh, Robert's lounge to, to do something real quick or you're hijacking or you're doing all that. So the movie is a beautiful movie. It's a great movie. One of my favorite movies, but not entirely true. And, Steve, people like you, you know, you're really trying to get to the bottom of this. Is there any way people can contact you if they want to speak to you, if they want to, maybe you guys want to share some information with Steve that you might know? Is there any way people can contact you? Yeah, so you can reach out to me. My email is novicehistorian at outlook.com. Right, novice historian at outlook.com. Any information, stories, photos, anything that you have, I'd be interested in hearing about anything. Um, when it comes to the Robert Slounce crews, the uh, the Latanza Highs, or anything really even Goodfellas related, so it could relate to you know Billy Vivenna or anybody like that, um, would be you could reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to to you know talk and speak with you novice historian at outlook.com and i will put steve's email in the description of this video
Yes, that's right. You did. I did. I remember you sending you and you have it right here. So let's look at the one that I that I had sent you to before we get to this. Uh, let's see here. So there we have there. If you guys see that guy in the background there with the uh, gray sweatshirt. And you know what? It looks like, is that like an S um, necklace hanging down from his neck? Yeah, that's what it looks like, yeah. S that for Stax, like S for Steven, S. probably S for Stax, right? Right, right. Wow, that is awesome. Good eye, too. I didn't see that. Look at that. I didn't see it before either. I just noticed it right now. Maybe I just thought it was a part of his shirt, but it seems to be maybe some kind of uh, necklace with an S, possibly. Or it could be on the shirt. I'm not sure. Either way. The yes is it's there. Definitely Steven. on him, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's definitely, definitely on him. him. Yeah, and but, I there's another one I you sent me from about a year ago. If, if you want, I'll show you that one as well. Yeah, let's look at that one too. Let's look at that. Yeah. Oh hell yeah, yeah! Look at that. That is cool. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that seems to be we, around the time of that video, right? Right. And if we did a side by side comparison, if we could compare. The, this photo or the last photo with this only confirmed photo we have for sure of Stax, right? The one that we know 100% is him. Then right. I think we could definitely say, listen, this guy looks just like him. He has even the same type of mustache yeah. and everything. And as you said before, a, a, a fall from grace, right? Of he course, just, yeah. He probably let himself go. He of probably course. used to work out a ton. Then he just stopped working out. Like, like anybody does nowadays, he just stopped working out. And then... Uh, yeah yeah there you it's, go i mean listen we, yeah. we spoke about his record i mean after the ali he was arrested numerous times you could see he's probably down and out he lost some weight i mean you know he's living on the fringes you know basically yeah yeah absolutely so just a couple and then i have another one too if you want to take a look not as good as the first two that i don't even know where you got them i was like whoa where did he get these dude i don't um, even know i was like scouring the internet like uh, ali press conference 1971 ali 71 i was doing all these crazy searches and things were just coming up you know? yeah all right let's see this like hey, he's, he's in the back here back. right he's a little yeah. out of the way but yep. he, that's 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 it has to be it's definitely the same guy right of course he's right around him and in every one of these clips too everybody he's right. always right next to ali so it, we can assume that he has to be the bodyguard right right i mean that's and then he looking like the guy and then somebody confirming yep that's him so of course of course and you know day, what i did yeah no go ahead i'm sorry steve no no no, no. Go, ahead. go ahead and you know what i did also in researching it i was like Okay, who were Muhammad Ali's trainers? Who were like some famous boxing men that were around him at the time? And I started going down that rabbit hole, and none of those guys' images or people came up to that guy right there. You know, right. none of them came up to Stack. Right. So, because I thought maybe he was like, you know, you got to check all the boxes, right? Is this some kind of trainer? Right. Is this guy with Ali in the 80s? And, and, you know, came up with nothing. It's only during that time period. That 71 time 70, period. That's it. 70, 71. Yeah. And 70, 71. It would not surprise me if there's some something of him speaking, move out of the way, get out of the way, that sort of thing. It would not right. surprise me if that is out there somewhere. Could be on YouTube. It could be in the back. It just tucked away in some news department. It 100%. would not surprise me. And it, it, yeah. And the same with that infamous Marty Krugman commercial. It's yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. It has to be out there. Uh, and they, I've heard people say that there are numerous commercials that he did in the 70s. Uh, the same with this, that the, there has to be something of him talking, speaking. And then we could know for sure. Even if you had Ali say stacks, go over there, that sort of thing, then that would con absolutely confirm it, right? right. Because they're not right. using his real Steven, they're going to use stacks. And that's what the newspapers refer to him as. That's probably what Ali referred to him as as well. Stacks. Right. So 100%. if you could get him saying, "Yep, that's absolutely 100 percent." There's Stacks Edwards. We, you know, we got him. after all this time, after 50 years, uh, we have you know so a little bit more about this guy and what he did and who he was. Exactly, and yeah, and let that goes. You know, and if you guys out there find any of that stuff, you could send it our way. You know, and if you guys, I'm going to ask too for me and Steve's sake. I mean, if you guys want to share this information with anybody, images, video, whether it be Reddit or anybody. Don't be afraid to like tell them come to NYC Crime Spot. You know, this is where I found it. You can see me and Steve have the conversation. You know, credit's not hard to give nowadays. It's actually very simple. 
Um, so just, you know, look out for, for, for people who are, who are providing you, you know, essentially a service, which is like, you know, YouTube journalism, giving you information, you know, it's just a good way to be, you know? <laughs> I, yeah. I, it costs a lot of money to get, have these subscriptions and time to a lot of money, a lot of time, uh, playing around with the search engines, right. To maybe put in a keyword in that you might get another video that pops up that could have somebody in it that is potentially stacks or anybody. It's just a lot of time, a lot of money. And I think you and I, I think the only thing we ask for is just credit. That's it. I didn't take the photo. Like we were talking before this, of course. I didn't take the photo of the guy, but you know, you find the photos, I find the photos right. and videos. So yeah. all, all I want is just listen. Yep, this is, I got this from this person's channel, or this is from novice historians, of course, uh, or, or NYC crime spots channel, just, just so, you know, people can get directed here. And maybe they, they want to know more and maybe, and that way we kind of build sort of like a, like a sort of a network of people that perhaps exactly. maybe they find stuff they share with us. And then, you know, we have a more plethora of resources and stuff to go by at the end of it. Exactly. Uh, media exactly. and images, articles, everything. So that's all we ask, I think is just to just give a little bit of credit when you, if you're going to reference this video or, or articles or whatever it might be. Yeah. And it's like, we were speaking on the phone. It's like, you know, we didn't take the photo. We weren't there, but you know, it's like an archeologist digging in Egypt, you know, he didn't carve that statue that he found under right. the sand somewhere, right. but you better believe his right. name's in the history book as finding that statue in Egypt. Right. So it's not King as Tut. serious King, as that, yeah. but you get, you guys kind of get it, right? Yeah. We, it's like with King Tut, right? They, those guys who found the tomb, right. they didn't, they didn't carve the gold or make their sarcophagus or whatever it might be, but they found it. So that's, that's all we ask for. Right. It, like I said, it takes a lot of time, a lot of money, especially these follow requests. Right. The FBI does not. They, they take their sweet time. Even ever since COVID, it's just there. So many requests. Oh they're God, sort of yeah. undermanned. I think there's still the backlog since yeah. then, even. So it's just Dude. it's just it takes a long, long time to get it. And, you know, patience is indeed a virtue. I always email them every so often and just say, hey, uh, what's what's going on with my request for this person or that person? So. I mean, and they, they will take their sweet old time with, with stuff. It is what it is. They they don't have a huge staff to do that to begin with there. Right. So you have to just you know, bear that in mind as well. And then not to mention they have to admit things and stuff. So it's, I mean, it just takes a while. And all we ask of is just give us a little bit of credit at the, at the end of the day. That's, that's it. I agree. I agree. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so second part of this upload, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, me and Steve's conversation before, and now we are joined by Mr. Rick DeMeo. Now, Rick reached out to me about a year ago at this point. I believe he watched this upload I did, and he sent me an email, and then we got to talking on the phone, and he said, you know, I grew up in Ozone Park. Not only was I familiar with stacks, but I actually lived on his block, and he started telling me about Ozone Park growing up and he had a, a couple of stack stories and rick is going to come in here to do that and we're going to look at the muhammad ali footage and rick is kind of the guy that's going to be like yep that stacks right yeah. so rick tell us a little bit about yourself if you don't mind tell us about you know growing up in ozone park kind of kind of that whole yeah. scene um so it was kind of ozone park richmond hill south ozone park so on the other side of 109th Avenue was Richmond Hill. I lived on the other side, so I was actually in South Ozone Park. <clears throat> and if you look at a map, South Ozone Park is right next to Kennedy Airport. I also lived right around the corner from Lefferts Boulevard. So Lefferts Boulevard, if you get on the Q10 bus, it goes right into Kennedy Airport. So a lot of people who lived in my neighborhood also worked at the airport. And I actually I worked at the airport in a duty-free shop one summer. Um, Stax, um, I don't know if he ever worked at the airport, but, um, he lived on my block and a lot of the older people knew him because when he would come back from wherever he was prior to when he came back on the neighborhood, he have a shopping bag and he would literally give out cartons of cigarettes. And those cartons of cigarettes most likely were stolen from Kennedy airport and people would buy them for, you know, back then in 19... 76, 77, 78 a carton of cigarettes may have gone for, I don't know, six, seven bucks. And he would sell them to him for three or $4. So um, it was interesting. He was kind of like 
uh, he was a very friendly guy, very affable. Uh, he had a very round face. He was kind of a, <clears throat> a bulbous looking guy. And he'd walk down the street, would always kind of saunter. And he looked like, like we always said, stacks of pancakes. Uh, I don't know how he got his name, but that's what we called him because that's what we knew him by. He also hung around on, on the corner on 111th Avenue and Leffitt's Boulevard, which was a place called the Goody Jar. Mm -hmm. And right down the street from 111th Avenue is Linden Boulevard. And right down the street from the Goody Jar on Linden Boulevard and Leffitt's Boulevard is Robert's Lounge. So right. Robert's Lounge, obviously, you know more about the history than I do. But the Goody Jar was a really cool candy store that later we discovered that on the on the other side of it, behind it, uh, they were selling nickel bags, uh, which was a five dollar bag a pot, and a tray bag, which was a three dollar bag a pot, to a lot of the people that hung out at PS One Hundred. Yeah. Um, now I was a little bit too young for that, but we kind of knew that um, Stacks was one of the guys that if you needed. Just to buy a joint, they called them a J back then. It was a buck. So if you were 16 years old and you bumped into Stacks down the street, you go, Stacks, you got a J, he'll sell you a joint for a dollar. Wow. And, you know, a couple of kids would, you know, hang around, smoke a joint, and you would get, you know, you get high just as much as you would hang around, drink a beer. Um, but one of the nights that I remember fondly is that a friend of mine, Scott Townsend, uh, we were hanging out in the corner because that's what he did at night. You, Said, yeah. Scott, you want to go out? You'd hang out and you'd hang out. And we weren't smoking or drinking. We were just hanging out talking. And Stax walks up to us and he said, guys, I need a favor. Um, I need you to watch this bag for me for about 10 minutes. And we didn't say what's in the bag. We said, sure, because we knew that everything with Stax was a transaction. So yeah. he would either give us, you know, a nickel bag, a couple of joints. But he said, he said, don't even look in the bag. If you're here in 10 minutes and the bag is there, I'll give you 20 bucks. If not, you're in trouble. So in a sense, we almost had to stay, right? <laughs> so <laughs> why, why would you give up 20 bucks? 20 bucks back then goes a long way. Yeah. So um, uh, he left. And of course, the first thing we did was we looked inside the bag. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't there when we did. But it was literally a, a brick of, it was probably about 10 inches high and about four inches wide. And it was wrapped in green paper. And it looked either like packed in pot or maybe mm -hmm. cash. We don't know. And we didn't pick it up and smell it. We just looked at it and said, don't touch it. So sure enough, he came back 10 minutes later. Um, and he gave us um, he gave us a couple of joints and he gave us 20 bucks. Wow. We kept like, word. Yeah, that was like that was so you know, when when people say I can't understand how kids in a really downtrodden neighborhood of like New York or Chicago or LA get caught up in this, in this, you know, this, this cycle of, you know, quitting school and, and selling drugs. Once you make 20 bucks for 10 minutes, you can see how easy it is. It's not one yeah. of those things that for a kid, he's going to go, do I want to go to school or do I want to, you know, hang out and, and make 20 bucks? Um, and the thing about it is, when, when he left, he goes, don't tell anybody about this. And we were scared of Stax because we knew that he was kind of like not connected with other people. What We knew that he had people above him that you just didn't, you just didn't, you didn't, you didn't betray him. You didn't betray his trust. So we didn't tell anybody about it. Um, and then it was about, I think, a year to maybe a year and a half later, um, this was you know, after the Lutanza heist, because I mean, when you're a kid at that age, you hear that kind of stuff and it goes way over your head. You don't really connect anything like my, right. my dad had mentioned before. We had no idea what was going on. Um, then all of a sudden, one night, detective knocked on the door and said, uh, did you guys see anything down at the end of the street a couple of nights ago? And they never really told us what happened, but they want to know if you saw something that may have led you to believe that something went on that was not cool. Now we had already had seen a bunch of cars that were dropped off at the end of a block. Cause the end of a block, there were two large apartment buildings. You can see them in some of the videos that you show. And usually when you have a big apartment building, um, you either have cars that are parked there for a long period of time or no cars at a park because it's not in front of anybody's house. 
So there were oftentimes if there was a car that was stolen, the car was usually dropped off there um, and basically left there until the police decided to basically tow the car away. But there were times when a car would be sitting there for almost, I'm not kidding you, three or four months. Wow. And during, and during the winter of 78, we had that huge blizzard. We had like 22 inches of snow. There was literally snow that went from one side of the street to the other. And there was this one car that was literally sitting with snow surrounding it for about two or three months that we knew that the owner was not coming back to it. So we figured out how to get into the car. So back then you can get one of those hangers, pull up the lock yeah. in the car, and we got in. And what we ended up doing, we ended up using that car to hang out at night when it was real cold out. <laughs> now, clearly we shouldn't be doing this, but because the car was sitting there and no one was, was towing it, we thought it was no problem. And the car was about four houses down from where I lived, down the end of the block. Um, and there would be sometimes three or four of us hanging out in the car. We'd bring our little boom box in the car and hang out, listen to music when it was really cold out. And then we got a little bit more, you know, adventurous and we started to, you know, light up a joint. Yeah. And then one night we noticed that the light on the front of my uh, house, the porch light went on and all of a sudden the door opened up and I can see my mother looking out. And at that point, someone lit up a cigarette and then lit up a joint. You can see the red glow <laughs> from the from the stoop. And all of a sudden, my mother comes walking down the sidewalk. <laughs> Three guys in the back of the car jumped out. I'm still in there. Place is filled with smoke. And she's like, get out of that car. <laughs> I'm like, I wasn't doing anything. They were smoking. And she knew that I didn't smoke cigarettes. But the two other guys were. And she goes, why did I keep seeing that red light glow there? And I'm like, I don't know. They were smoking. But clearly, I was busted that night. But the thing yeah. about it was um, stacks routinely would walk up and down the street and you never thought anything of it. He was always really nice. He was really smart. I, I shouldn't say really smart, but he was really wise. He knew what was going on around the area. He knew everybody. And then all of a sudden you didn't see him. And for yeah. about two weeks, everybody's like, I haven't seen stacks. And that's when it was discovered that he was, um, he was whacked on the second floor of 10916, which was, the friend of mine, uh, Robert Marisi, his parents owned the house and they rented out the second floor. Um, and they also found out that that same night, they think, when Stax was killed, that my neighbor down the street had his car stolen. Oh, and wow. Then they later, then they later found that car nearby one of, the, um, one of the jobs that was committed in Brooklyn around the time when I think, forget who was killed in the back of their house, that famous seen with the cigars hanging out of his mouth. Um, but Galante. anyway, what was that? Galante? Galante, right, right, or Galati. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all that stuff was was going on, and you didn't really know it until much later on what had happened. Yeah. And then when you see the movie, you put the whole movie together. Exactly. And you're like, Holy shit, that's what happened at that yeah, time. I'm going to show the article, Rick. So here we have um, – now this article comes out on the – I believe the 20th, and I believe Stax is killed at – on the 18th um and you see here uh seek gun death clue queens police yesterday were seeking possible eyewitnesses and information concerning the shooting death of stephen edwards 31 of 109 16 123 in south ozone park and then it goes on to say that he shot several times and somebody even it says here um that there was some kind of a, a, a an anonymous call that someone said yeah some guy's been shot over on so and so address so i don't know I don't know who might have made that call. I don't know. Maybe it could have even been those guys kind of like, uh, yeah, just letting the officers know. Um, right. So you do remember kind of all the, the stuff going around there at that time, right? Well, oh, yeah, because it was only a few days later when the detective came to the house and knocked on the door. And that's when the guy was asking my father what was going on. And, and usually, you know, when it when it's not when it's not a cop and it's plain clothes, you, you treat it a little bit differently. Right. right? right. You go. Um, man, this is more than just like a cop saying what had happened, where sometimes you go, no, I don't know anything. Then when it's a detective, you offer up a little more information, but they never really said, they never really offered up any clues. Now, all they were talking to is my dad. My dad had no clue what was going on on the street because 
you know, when, when you're an adult, you don't really know that part of the corners. You only know what's inside the front of your house. Right. Now, if you would have talked to one of us, like if they would have said, are your kids around or, or do kids know anything about it? We would have probably said something that probably would have helped them out. But I don't even remember being home that night. I was nor- I was normally not home. I was usually working um, in the evenings. Uh, but I do remember my dad talking about it like the, the day or two later. But uh, it never really came up more than, by the way, there were cops coming around asking for stuff. Because <laughs> at that point, there was always a lot of <laughs> kind of weird stuff going on around the neighborhood. We just kind of said, you know, that's probably, you know, it, it's par for the course. Matter of fact, I think later on that summer, we had people who moved in across the street from us. Um, and they had moved in from the Bronx, a uh, Puerto Rican family. And, you know, they were moving up to the good times, so to say. They were in a neighborhood that was white and not like the South Bronx. And they used to play a lot of music in their backyard. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a little bit on the loud side, but that's what people did. And then all of a sudden they noticed that they came home and all their stereo equipment was stolen. They had equipment in their their back and I think in their basement. It was all stolen, a bunch of speakers, a bunch of, you know, tuners and amps and things like that like house music and um you know they were pretty upset about it they're like we moved here because we thought we'd get away from it and i'm like this isn't really that good of a neighborhood and the first thing that detective said was have you checked behind the garage and they go no well they checked behind the garage and sure enough all the stuff that was stolen was back behind the garage with covers on it so they stole it moved it back there we're going to come back in that night and take it and the detectives, I guess, were casing the joint, and the guys came back, and they were able to nab them. Wow! Um, so that's how it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you took it during the day, and you came back at night, and and put it into the back of a van, and and there were sometimes you get people coming down the street, open up the van, and go, "Hey, I want I have speakers to sell you on," and I go, "No, no I don't want," because I knew they were hot. Yeah. At that point. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when you knew stacks, as I mean. This would have been what he looked like, basically, yeah. right? I mean, yeah. yeah. And, and you can see he doesn't have a face that that looks like a guy that's going to hurt you, right? right. He just, he just kind of had a, like an affable face. And, and he, most of the time, he was smiling. So when I got to talking to you, I brought up, and this is kind of one of the main themes of this upload here, obviously talking about stacks. And I hope you you watch it, Rick, because before you come on, we do talk about you know, a lot of interesting things as far as his criminal record and right. a, a lot of stuff. But I want to show you some stuff. I, I think you're going to find this really interesting. So here is an article here. Now, this is in 71. This is around the time of Ali Frazier uh, 1, the fight oh, yeah. of the century, right? So let's read this. New York. Stax Edwards is Muhammad Ali's man. He's one of Muhammad Ali's mean men. He is the big, mean-looking black man you always saw with Muhammad Ali when Muhammad Ali was trying to fight his way out of a crowd. Stax Edwards has shoulders like a truck, and when the crowds moved into Muhammad Ali, Stax Edwards always moved the crowds. I'm a professional crowd clearer, Stax Edwards would say, who weighs 270 pounds. And then it goes on to say, Stax Edwards is a mean mother. Stax Edwards had to clear the way over a crowd outside the flowers on Fifth Avenue Hospital off Central Park West at 106th Street. Then it goes to talking about how um, you know, he's clearing the way. He's always there. So this is another article around that time. Uh, once again, Stax Edwards sat his 285 pounds overflowing wow. the chair. Kind of like you said, the pancake thing, right? What he was yeah, saying yeah. Stax, yeah, that, yeah, I think that's how he got his name, but I don't know. It might have been. Uh, overflowing the chair on the 25th floor of the New Yorker Hotel. Nobody got by him in the room he was guarding. Muhammad Ali, who is to fight Frazier tonight at Madison Square Garden for the heavyweight championship of the world, was relaxing inside. I don't like reporters, said Stax. It might be different if Burt Lancaster wanted in. And then he goes on to talk about, I'll be guarding him till Tuesday. And I, I guess um, Angelo Dundee, I guess the manager, is uh, the one who um, appointed him this guard. Now, how he got the job is very fuzzy. We really can't mm-hmm. figure that out. But I'm going to show you some cool stuff right now, Rick. I think you're going to get a kick out of this. So I edited some videos together that I found from that, from press conferences and stuff around that time. So let's watch this. Now, I don't know. Maybe, uh... He's, uh, it's not that his fellows just tired. I'm sorry, just for clarity, you're going to see the guy in the Navy uh, behind Ali oh. up there. I, this is my defense. Yeah, I'm out of that. range. I have a built-in yeah. radar. See. Pop, I'm moving and dancing. And I know when I'm in hitting range. When I'm in hitting range, I might come up. 
as long as I'm not getting rain. Right, Burke Lancaster? Well, how do you compare? Romania. It is back. You see the pancake, like you said. That's funny. Well, have, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I have helpless fellows driving me around and system trainers and spawn partners. But guards for what? What do I need guards for? They can't guard presidents. If somebody wants you, they're going to get you. I, I'd run into no hostility, even during the draft pressure. And when they first heard my religion, black Muslims, as they call it, even when the stuff was at the. So we got that. And then I'm going to show you some stills. Here you go there. Wow. Here you well, go there. Where did you, and, where uh, did you find these? So I'm going to show you a couple more. Then, yeah, I'll go into that. So here, here you see right there. There he is right there. Then you see him in the background there standing up. Well, he was everywhere around him. How did he and it's so funny him? that you said the pancakes. I can't get it out of my head because when you see him sitting there, you see how his body stacks like yeah. uh, like pancakes. And then the article overflowing in his chair. Yeah, because he, he, he wasn't that tall. He was only about like barely six foot. And there he is back there. Wow. Boy, how did he how did he fall from grace? How did he go from doing that to I guess Ali just I guess stopped fighting right after a while. I mean, or or didn't I fight as much. Well. No, I think he was only there for that one Ali Frazier one fight. It, oh. I don't know how he got the job. I don't get it. It's there's nothing there. But I'll tell you how it came about. It so we came upon uh, news articles mentioning this Stax Edwards character, mm -hmm. right? Right. Who was guarding Ali, and we we're like, huh, that's really weird. So then I started looking at press conferences from around that time. And I start seeing all this, some of this footage, and I'm like, wow, if that guy is not the guy from the mugshot, then I don't know who is. And then I started looking at trying to find photos from that time, from that era when he was fighting Frazier. And then you start seeing stuff like this, start putting it together. And you could see here, this is from 74. So this is three years later. You could tell he's a little down and out. You could tell he's yeah. probably lost some weight. He doesn't look that great. Um, and like, yeah, quite the fall from grace. I mean, did you know anything about that Ali stuff? No, no, not at all. It and seems that, to that be a mystery. One, yeah, that, that was one thing about, about Stax is he was a man of few words. He was like a transactional guy. Um, hey, how are you? Hey, what's up, man? I don't think he ever knew my name. Uh, we knew him, and he would always be walking down the street and even have a bag with him. You knew that there was something in there. We called it the goody bag because he yeah, yeah. used to hang out at the goody jar. <laughs> um, in fact, it was funny. A friend of mine, a um, guy named Danny Bedillo, uh, Puerto Rican guy who was one of my best friends growing up. And I go, Danny, you remember Stax? He goes, oh, yeah, my mother used to buy cigarettes from him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and and she owned three buildings. This was really great because both of his parents, immigrants from Puerto Rico, they came here. They bought three buildings. His father was a short order cook in Manhattan and a great success story. Yeah. He became a cop. His brother became a, a pharmacist. And when he goes... Yeah, my mother used to buy cigarettes all the time, and we knew that they were hot. And here this guy later became a cop. So we are, he, yeah. he kind of had that sense of right and wrong. But at the same time, you knew that if people just didn't have enough money to buy stuff, you know, from around the corner, and someone gave it to you for half the price, you you took it. You know, that's just, that's what you did back then. Yeah. And, you, you didn't, and you didn't think of any, you didn't think of where you got it other than you knew it probably came from the airport. And it didn't come from because back then, if you think about it, can you really steal a carton of cigarettes from a store? That's kind of hard to do. Right. So you knew it came from the cargo area because the cargo area, if you know, Kennedy Airport is right down from Lefferts Boulevard. So if you go all the way down Lefferts and you kind of go in about two or three blocks, that was the cargo area. So to come out of there and go right down Lefferts to Don Pepe's or Robert's Lounge or the, the track, which was only about four or five blocks the other way. It was kind of like part of, of living in that area. It's just, it just, it, it was what it was. And as long as you know, no one was being killed over it or, or hurt over it. It was probably coming from a big truck from the airport. It was what they called the five finger discount. Exactly. Yeah. And Rick, we spoke about something a while ago when we were on the phone that I wanted you to touch on because, <clears throat> you know, I'm a teenager when 9-11 happens. I'm growing up, coming of age in a post-9-11 world, right? So all I ever know is airports that are freaking Fort Knox. You can't really do anything. Oh, and I yeah. think you said something to me on the phone a while back, 
something about the accessibility of JFK. I think you said something about you would ride your bike right up into the thing. You're like, nobody even knew you were there. You could have did anything. Is that yeah. – so go into that. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, between my – uh sophomore and junior year in college um i worked uh for uh, a duty free shop at uh the twa terminal that's the one with the swooping looks like like wings like a on a go uh, but i always took the, the the bus in there the q10 bus um the following year i worked at a place called metro weather service because i'm a meteorologist and i was going to school back then and i got a job at uh, Metro Weather Service, which was next to Hang, which, which which was in Hangar 11. Hangar 11 is all the way on the other side of the airport uh, by Rockway Boulevard and Baisley Avenue, I think, way on the other side. So Kennedy Airport is huge. So I used to ride my bike down Leffitt's Boulevard because Leffitt's Boulevard is 119th Street and I live on 120th. So I go up Leffitt's, I go all the way over the van, not the van, but the Bell Parkway onto South Conduit and take what was called back then Radar Road. Radar Road literally went all the way along the outskirts of the airport. And I would go along Radar Road across the Van Wick, which went into Kennedy Airport where the mm -hmm. Bell Park was. So they kind of crossed the T there. And then I would come around the backside of the airport um, and go to Hangar 11. <clears throat> and the reason why I mentioned the accessibility of it is because back then this was 1980 um this was 83 to 84 back then you could ride your bike literally right into that area where hangar 11 was and <clears throat> i don't know exactly how close it was to the lufthansa uh cargo terminal the one that was boosted by jimmy collins um but i remember seeing oftentimes huge trucks taking cargo from Rockway Boulevard into that area and eventually loading them up onto those smaller cars, you know, those little things that run around the airport and bringing them over yeah. to the cargo area. So to me, when I, when I link all this back, um, you can, and if you remember the movie Goodfellas in the, in the beginning when um, Tommy D. Simone and um, uh, Henry Hill steal the, the truck, that truck was parked outside of the diner that we used to go to all the time, which was right next to Baisley Avenue, I think it was, and Rockway Boulevard. Because if you think about it, anywhere you go within a half mile of Kennedy Airport, there's a diner there because there's yeah. a 24-hour 20, operation. And there were diners everywhere. And it was always the same sort of people, people who worked overnight jobs. I would work to 2.30 a.m. to 9.30 shift in the morning. Um, and they were basically getting, you know, your sweet rolls, your breakfast, your coffee. And you know what? You went in there, you ordered your food, you picked it up, and you left. It's just what you did. But the ability to go from the airport property across Rockwood Boulevard to the diner and back was like driving into a shopping center. It was nothing. Yeah. There, was, there was no security. So when you see that happening in Goodfellas, you go, how did how did that how was that allowed to happen? Uh, why? Because nothing like that ever happened prior to that, which was 9-11. Now it's like you said, it's a fortress. But back then, the access was just easily accessible. And part of it also, the airport was so big. There were so many little nooks and crannies. You could hop a fence and get from one place to the other. And, and no one really knew about it because it wasn't it wasn't thought to be a place that something like that could be boosted but obviously um henry hill and the rest of the guys or jimmy collins kind of knew otherwise jimmy burke yeah jimmy burke right 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 jimmy burke so i got to ask you too cuz you mentioned goodfellas yeah so you're from the area of course you have your stack stories and all that stuff so goodfellas comes out i think what 91 or something like that you watch the movie for the first time. You see Samuel Jackson stacks. What, what, what do you think when you see that? It's got to be a little funny, right? Oh, I'm in the movie theater. I'm like going, that happened on my block. And, yeah. and while the movie is going, person I was with is like, what, what happened on your block? That. And they're like, quiet, quiet. People around me going, shut up. And I'm like, that happened on my block. They're like, no way. I'm like, yeah. And, and the thing about it is back then, you know, you didn't have Wikipedia. 
You didn't have the internet where you could look it up and stuff like that. So it, you know, time went on. And then more or less when these things began to come out, things began to come out. And then when your Crime Stopper thing came out, I'm looking at this, I'm like, wow, this guy's doing some really great investigative research on this. I'm like, I got to call this guy and ask him what Thank was going you. on. Like how yeah. he knew about this stuff. But the fact that is when the more I, the more, and I've probably seen the movie now 20 times, if not more. Um, there's literally so many parts of that movie that I recognized because so much of that movie was filmed in areas where I, where I grew up. For yeah. instance, um, the, the scene where the two people were shot in the pink Cadillac mm. was underneath the, uh, the Long Island Railroad um, train tracks that was right off of Jamaica Avenue and Lefferts Boulevard. So Jamaica Avenue and Lefferts Boulevard meet perpendicular from that, you have Myrtle Avenue, which goes all the way, believe it or not, to, like think, the Williamsburg Bridge in Brooklyn. But underneath those tracks was free parking where you would park your car if you wanted to go to a, the, the restaurants that were literally right across the street. And one of the restaurants, which was famous, was called uh, Jan's. So Jan's is J-A-H-N. And my parents used to take us there all the time at the end of the school year. Because that was a place that not only could you have five kids like we had in my family eat, you know, basically hamburger, French fries and a cherry Coke for $1.99, but they had like the most amazing desserts. So Jan's was a place that was synonymous with that area, because if you couldn't park on, on the street, which you never could, you parked underneath the train tracks. Mm -hmm. and, the, and those were... That was like a huge concrete structure because those train tracks were actually underneath the J train. So the J train, yeah. which went through Jamaica, was above, and the Long Island Railroad came underneath. So it was a lower, it was a lower trestle. So as soon as I saw that, I'm looking at this and I'm going, I know exactly where that is. So the person I was with was like saying, Would you stop telling me that you know exactly? <laughs> where this is. And, and I just, I just happened to know that that's where, that's where it was occurring. So that was, in, that was another interesting scene. And I think, you know, the way that Martin Scorsese and whoever else set up his, you know, uh, screenplay or however they do it, um, they didn't have to go very far to go. This is a perfect location. This is a right. perfect location. This is a perfect location. Like if, like I visited my brother who lives in Long Island city just two weeks ago and he picked me up from LaGuardia Airport. We got off the um, Long Island Expressway and did a little bit of a loop underneath all the bridges that, or the little overpasses that come into the 59th Street Bridge. <clears throat> and literally right around that area, it looked like the that scene where Jimmy Collins was telling <clears throat> Henry Hill's wife to go in there, to go in there, to go in there. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but my brother said, no, that's not it. But it looks like it. Yeah. So there's, there's so many places in Queens and Brooklyn that you don't have to do much. It's like right there. That's your screenplay. So, yeah, yeah. That's, what, yeah. that's what makes Scorsese some of those movies great because he films in New York. He does, you know, a lot of these movies that make these mob movies, you could tell it's like some soundstage in California or whatever. Or whatever oh, it yeah. Is. So, yeah, that's like a, that's kind of, you know, whatever. And, you know, touching back what you said before, you know like this video I did here. I mean, since I started this channel, one of the greatest things is people like you that send me emails and tell me so many stories, Rick. I mean, I've gotten so many great stories about people who grew up in these areas, who mm -hmm. remember this stuff, who appreciate seeing the neighborhood again. Maybe they don't live in New York anymore and they're getting to see some of this stuff. And right. it, it's, it's really great, man. And having you on is, is so great because you know, unfortunately, Rick, I'm in a genre where there's like a lot of naysayers and people are, oh, they always second guess you like, oh, how do you know if that's true? That's not true. This and that, you know, and, you know, I provided plenty of evidence before speaking to you with Steve, who was on before. But just to have you on, I mean, and for you to see these photos. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I and remember be like that stacks. Yeah. I remember him growing up as a kid. And I'm sure that if you were able to talk to um, some detectives. Yeah. Uh, oh, my God. You know. Real quickly, when I was a newsboy, I delivered the New York Daily News for um, five years. I was getting up five in the morning, delivering it before I went to school. And I still remember the day that I was mugged. And I was probably about, 
I don't know, maybe 14. And it was like mid-November. It was already getting dark out. It was a Friday afternoon. So you do your collecting on Friday and Saturday. And people today don't know what that is, but collecting is you deliver the papers and you knock on the door and you go press or news because Long Island Press and news. And they, you know, they knew you because you delivered it, but because I delivered in the morning, they'd never see me. So they go, oh, hi, how are you? And I go, news, by the way, you owe me two weeks. You know, back then, Daily Sunday was was a dollar twenty-five for a week. That was a week. Yeah. So Daily Sunday was a dollar twenty-five. So if I was collecting, I had a route of like maybe 70 papers. If I was collecting for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Uh, there was a pretty good chance I had like 50 or 60 bucks on me. So I remember I'm, I'm collecting from a bunch of these row houses and I'm collecting, collecting, collecting. And I noticed across the street, I, I kept seeing this one guy. Um, he just kept standing there, standing there. And he's like standing, standing, standing. And I'm like, okay, every once in a while I look and I see him, I see him. And I was always careful. But then all of a sudden I come walking back to my bike and out of the side of these two bushes, comes this guy, not more than the same height as me. And I was a big kid, but um, he had an Afro. He wasn't black, but he looked Hispanic. And right, right then and there, he pulls out a knife. And I know what a knife looks like. <laughs> wow. And it was, it was dark out, but I could see the knife. And it was about this long. It was a switchblade. You, know, you just went like that. He goes, he goes uh, give me all your money. I'm a Puerto Rican. Us Puerto Ricans don't fool around. And I went, Okay. Now I kept my money in like four different places. So I would take money and put it in my sock, sock, back pocket, back pocket. And I noticed I was taking a really long time to get to it. And I can see he was getting kind of nervous because he's looking around and he goes, hurry up, man, hurry up, man. And I went, all right. I go, well, how much do you want? He goes, all of it. So I gave him some and all of a sudden you hear someone's door open up and he ran. So he got about $18, I think. That was it. I had a lot more on me. Um, and I remember I was like, I just got ripped off. You know, I wasn't scared, but I was like, fuck. So I got on my bike, rode home. I told my parents what happened. Oh, my mom, my dad wasn't home yet. And my brother's like, why didn't you do anything? I'm like, are you kidding me? The guy had a knife. He goes, well, it sounded like you were bigger than him. I'm like, Mike, he had a knife, right? I wasn't going to mess around. So uh, we called the cops. Um, the tech detectives got on the phone. They said, come down to the 106 precinct, which was on Liberty Avenue and 106th Street. That's how it worked, 106, 106 precinct. And they had me there for almost two hours looking at mugshots, mugshots, mugshots. And it's funny because the detective, big white guy with the bald head, looked like a typical detective. He's like, anybody, anybody, anybody? I go, Hate to say it, but they all look the same to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, uh. And and he laughed, and my dad laughed, and I'm like, they do. They all looked the, because they were they were all the same. Because first off, I described it as someone who was you know a certain. So they weren't going to put a white guy in. You know what I'm saying? Right. So the fact that they were all the same wasn't a racist comment. But after you look at twenty or thirty pictures, I'm like, they're all the same. Um, and we never caught the guy. Uh, but it was it was one of those things that, you know, it was kind of part of that neighborhood. Yeah. And um, I got I got mugged another time, my brother and I on Queens Boulevard. Um, and it was two guys, you know, they bumped into us and they took some money and then they ran. It was one of those things. And it was like you kind of knew how to survive just by knowing not how to be uh, a hero or trying to protect yourself and you knew that what they were doing wasn't going to change much but at the same time you felt like each time you were doing you were you were allowing that to happen you were kind of giving in a little bit giving in a little bit but you didn't want to be the one that got that got stuck you know yeah, and and kids had more freedom back then right i mean oh god yeah even even like me um rick like like 20 <clears throat> years ago when i'm you know 13 14 years old you know I would be out on my bike or we would be on the streets on one corner. There would be kids all over. That was their corner. Right. And this was our corner. And right. you go in front of the deli. There's like five bikes outside for the kids inside getting stuff. And I don't mean to sound like, I, you know, a certain way, but you know, I drive around my neighborhood now. I mean, if I see one kid on a bike, it's a lot. I don't, 
it sounds cliche to say because everyone says it, but you just don't see it anymore. You don't really see the no. kids holding down the corner no. candy store. Oh, those are the kids that are always there. Those yeah. are the kids there. It's it's changed a lot, man. It's changed yeah, a and, lot. And, uh, and speaking of bikes, I was I remember we used to take out bikes to Rockway Beach all the time. From where I lived in South Osa Park, six yeah. miles down Cross That's Bay Road, yeah, all yeah. the way over the Cross Bay Bridge and the Broad Channel Bridge. That's what we used to do. And we were coming back, and there was a place called the Big Bow Wow on Cross Bay Boulevard. You can look it up. It doesn't exist anymore. But it was a place where you put your bike outside, you went inside, you played pinball. And I come back outside, and what do I do? I see my bike is gone. Someone freaking – and this was, this was a beautiful 10-speed I just got for my birthday maybe six months before. I was so pissed because it was my bike. Anyway, um, it was my fault. I didn't have a lock on it. But not many people had locks on bikes back then, you know, and they were and the bikes were literally all packed up against the wall. But my bike was the nicest one that was taken. So I came in, I started looking around asking, and this one guy who I knew from a friend of mine goes, Your bike was stolen. I'm like, Yeah, he goes, Fuck. And I'm like, why? He goes, Well, it's my job to make sure that bikes aren't stolen. <laughs> so it was on him that the bike was stolen. He goes, I think I know who took it. I'm gonna get your bike back. Wow. He goes, but don't come back until later on this afternoon. Um, give me your number. I'll give you a call. Because he didn't want me to see the kid who took the bike because he thought oh, I would God. bring some friends. So it was one of those even exchanges. So I went home. I had to ride up back on my friend's bike, which wasn't fun for three miles. I came back later in a car. I never told my parents about it because I would have gotten in trouble because it was a brand new bike that I got for my birthday. I had no lock on. So I never told my parents. I went. The guy's like, here's your bike. Don't say anything. Because he didn't even want to tell his boss that wow. the bike was stolen because it was his job to keep kids from having their bike stolen. So that's just kind of, you know, the kind of stuff that yeah. went on. That's the you way know? it was, right? Yeah. It was the way it was. But you know what? It taught me a lesson. I never went anywhere ever again without having a lock on the bike. And my bike was never stolen again. But, man, the feeling of having your bike stolen is the worst it's happened to me. You know what? It happened to me too. And you know what? The worst part about it was Rick, when my bike was stolen, I felt so bad because my father bought me that bike. Right. Right. My parents right? bought me that bike for my birthday. We yeah. didn't, we weren't rich. We didn't have money. Uh, mm -hmm. My father took me to the bike store. There was this bike I wanted so bad. And even as a kid, like I wasn't exactly mad that I didn't have a bike. I was so mad that my dad bought me that bike. Right. Right. I even get sad thinking about it now, even though it's just like, one of those things, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was that kind of a neighborhood where you you, you kind of learned how to grow up in a hurry, and a lot of it wasn't taught by your parents. It was taught by the neighborhood, um, and it wasn't even taught by people. So I just remember I I got home. My mother was like, "Where's your bike?" And I go, "Oh, I left it over at Danny." She's like, "Okay." And then later on, she's like, "Where are you going?" I go, I'm going back over to Danny's to get my bike. She's like, okay. I went back, got my bike. When I came back home, all I could think of is like, is like, don't tell them anything what happened and 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 just move on. And and I did. And yeah. you know, I, but but the thing about getting mugged and getting robbed, um, I always remembered every time I went out collecting, because I still had my news route for another two years, I would always look around. <laughs> yeah. Always look around. <laughs> I, like, like if I start to see someone, I get on my bike and I ride away. And part of that was becoming streetwise. And also mm -hmm. knowing that if I did see someone, I would get on my bike and I would ride not away from that person, but I would ride right past that person. And I would, wouldn't look at their eyes. I'd look towards them and around them to show them that I wasn't scared of them. Yeah. You know, yeah. kind of like what Stax did, you know, where Stax cleared the room and you go, look, I'm here and you can't F with me. And in a way, if it worked once, you felt good about it and you kept doing it until maybe it didn't work anymore. But it, right. it worked for me. Yeah. Well, Rick, listen, this was so fun, man. I mean, yeah. really happy you decided to come on. You know, we got some real confirmation once again from, from yeah. you, a man who lived on the block with stacks who yeah. who knew this gentleman and who can confirm yeah. that this is the man in these photos here 
and we saw some of those videos. I mean, it's so it's so cool. And, you know, for us who like when I research this like mob or crime stuff, it's like a lot of the times, Rick, it's like we see photos of these people. We never get to hear their voices. We never get to right. see them. In mo we never get to see them in motion. And to see like like this, we'll play it one more time to see like stacks in motion like this character that most yeah. people know from Goodfellas, Samuel Jackson, right? And, and he and there he is right there. Yeah, like number one buddy, right? Yeah, he was the guy during that time. As long as I'm not hitting range, right, Burt Lancaster? We will forward a little bit, and you see him pounding around with Ali over here. How did, how did you get for what? Video? What for? They can't guard you. president. Somebody wants you, they're going to get you. I mean, this I kind of stuff just doesn't exist. Yeah, so luckily, I mean, there's like these boxing channels on YouTube that have archived some of this stuff. So I started looking like, you know, uh, Ali Frazier won press conference. So and I just kept looking and looking and trying to find all the stuff. And eventually, there it was. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah, yeah. It, it, so, it's, it's amazing that <clears throat> that you're able to put this stuff out there. Like I said, you were talking to my dad earlier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My dad now has the ability with his Comcast. He just says YouTube, and then he just yeah. he now goes New York Crime Spot, and he <laughs> oh just starts God. and he just starts looking at this stuff. And he goes, "That is so cool, Rick, was, man. I know oh, that. Man. I know that. I know that." And like you said, like I said, he was telling you before about um, his younger brother Vito, who we called Uncle Junie because it was Vito Junior, because my grandfather was Vito and my uncle was Vito. That's why his name was Junie for Junior, and. He died, oh God, almost almost 20 years ago. My dad's still alive. So he died young. He had diabetes. He didn't have a very good health. They found him dead in his in his apartment. Um, and when we later found out that um he had this lifestyle that wasn't exactly the best. He never married. He had he had two very steady girlfriends, which he kept apart. <clears throat> they never knew each other. Um and like I said, he used to hang out at the Lindenwood restaurant or or diner, which you 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 talked about. Still there, yeah, still there. Yeah, still there. And you know, in Tudor Village, if you know where Tudor Village is, um, I think you do, right? If you Tudor look up Village, there, yeah, Tudor Village is literally right on the edge of Ozone Park. So it goes Ozone Park, Tudor Village, and then City Line. Okay, so yeah, remember, yeah. If you remember <clears throat> where they found Stax's van was in City Line, and City Line is actually in Brooklyn, which is right next to the Brooklyn Queens line. That's why they call it City Line. Because because the reason why is back then, it's like when you were going from Queens to Brooklyn, you were kind of going into the city, so to say. That's why they call it City Line. But Tudor Village was right next to that, and that's where my uncle, that's where my dad grew up um, as a kid in the, in the 30s and 40s. And it's funny, real quickly, before we say goodbye, and I said to my dad, Dad, you know, I... I never knew which hospital you were born in. And he goes, hospital? I was born in the in the in the in the bedroom in Tudor Village. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. He goes, Yeah, there was a midwife came in and you know, grandma, my grandmother's name was uh, Conchetta. So both of them came off the boat. Uh, so Conchetta and Vito, and they had um they owned two houses and a house in the beach in Long Beach. Um, and for two people off the boat that never made it past eighth grade they did they did pretty well for themselves so uh yeah it, amazing yeah they're yeah, pretty lucky yeah pretty lucky for that so i guess i guess the neighborhood taught them as well right true yeah yeah <clears throat> so rick hang out for one second i'm gonna i'm gonna end this here uh just hang out for a minute um thank you so much once again i hope everyone watching enjoyed this upload um with first talking with steve now talking with rick you guys saw a lot of uh documents early on in this upload you saw the video and then we have uh, a kid from ozone park right uh rick who grew up on the same block as stacks who has some great stories growing up in that area and if anyone else is out there who has more stories if you want to talk my emails on my channel nyccrimespot at gmail.com rick once again thank you so much brother i really appreciate you coming on yeah and if there's any other way that i can promote this where um it can get you a little bit higher up the chain of notoriety and maybe some monetary values because i think stuff like this uh is worth a lot so brett you're one of a kind man thank you rick thank you so much man all okay. right everybody we'll see you soon thanks everybody for watching